Live from KSA 12, Good Morning San Antonio starts right now. It's Thursday. It is the third. We're about 22 days from Christmas. Uh, it's arriving pretty quickly. And normally procrastinators, you could get a pass, but this year it's going to be more critical than ever that you get your uh, gifts shipped on time, if not in advance. Oh, most definitely, especially, you know, with the pandemic here and a lot of people are not going to visit in person, so they want to ship their gifts and more people will be doing that. We've got some shipping deadlines to pass along to you here, beginning with the U.S. Postal Service. For their USPS retail ground service, they said the latest you can ship is December 15. For Priority Mail Express service, the latest you can ship is December 23rd. So UPS, their option, shipping option, UPS ground, uh, December 15th is a deadline they're putting there, uh, but they're shipping another shipping option, but UPS next day air, that's December 23rd. What about our friends over at FedEx? Well, they say their FedEx Smart Post deadline, the cheapest option is December 9th, so just mere days away. And their most expensive options, you yes. can still ship same day for Christmas Day itself. And that would be FedEx, FedEx same day, FedEx same day, City Priority, and FedEx same day, City Direct, all uh, could get there by the 25th. And that leaves Amazon. That's right. Amazon has not released its 2020 holiday shipping calendar, but last year the company recommended buyers uh, send products no later than December 22nd or December 23rd third for Christmas Day arrival. Of course, it depends on uh, whether the buyer is a prime member or whether the recipient lives and where the recipient lives and the product being shipped. So a lot of things to consider when shipping through Amazon. And the sh shipping crush is coming again with so many folks buying online this year. You want to get those packages again in the mail as soon as possible. Look for shipping deadlines on KSAT.com. The article right there with all these uh, dates mm -hmm. for you there. On KSAT.com and uh, good news. Uh, you still have time, <laughs> at least for a now. A little bit of time. At least for today. <laughs> for now, let's look at today's 9 at 9. The U.S. surpassed 100,000 COVID-19 hospitalizations yesterday despite progress on the vaccine front. Health officials say the next few months will still be challenging. I actually believe they're going to be the most difficult time in the public health history of this nation. Nearly 100 world leaders scheduled to speak at a U.N. special session starting today on the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. More than one and a half million people have died from the virus worldwide. Former Presidents Barack Obama, George W. Bush and Bill Clinton have all agreed to get the COVID-19 vaccine once it's approved. And they'll get it on camera to help promote its safety and encourage others to do the same. The teen accused of killing two protesters in Kenosha, Wisconsin back in August expected back in court today. Kyle Rittenhouse's lawyer is expected to ask a judge to dismiss two of the six charges against him. San Antonio Assistant City Manager and Metro Health Interim Director Dr. Colleen Bridger has notified City Manager Eric Walsh that she will be leaving her post in January. It's not clear who will replace her. The U.S. is temporarily withdrawing staff from our embassy in Baghdad, Iraq, amid concerns of retaliation one year after the assassination of Iranian General Qassem Soleimani. The U.S. killed the general by drone strike this past January. The Census Bureau has discovered some data issues while tallying the 2020 census. This could delay the full count until February. House of Representatives set to pass the Big Cat Public Safety Act today, banning the private ownership of lions and tigers. Tiger King star Carol Baskin and her husband Howard had spent years lobbying for this legislation. Boeing's 737 MAX jet is back in the air for the first time in nearly two years. The company took journalists and American Airlines employees on a short flight from Dallas to Tulsa, Oklahoma. The first commercial flight is scheduled for later this month, and that's today's 9 at 9. 902 right now, 44 degrees out at the airport. So it's cold, and Justin, I understand there is stuff in the air. Yeah, I've been getting a lot of angry messages as of late, <laughs> some text messages. Uh, yeah, if you saw the push alert earlier, a little bit of mountain cedar showing up in today's Palenque. I know that's not what we want to hear. It's low, thankfully, but we're getting into that season. Right now, we're in the 40s. We think we'll be in the mid-50s later this afternoon. Temperatures up around 55, 56 for high this afternoon uh, with some breezy northwesterly winds. 62 Friday, 61 on Saturday. 
Saturday we'll see some more cloud cover. Just a heads up, maybe a sprinkle. I don't think we're going to see much really at all rain wise, but uh, a lot of clouds and they'll keep things a little bit cooler for the first half of the weekend at least. And uh, temperatures right now again 44 Canyon Lake 41 Boulevard 44 popular number there across Bear County and uh, still below freezing out of Las Maples 31 degrees there. We mentioned the pollen count. Yes, Mountain Cedar showed up for the first time this season today. It's in the low category at 20 and looking at the forecast uh, will again be up around 56 northwesterly winds. 10 to 15 miles per hour and gusty guys. Thank you very much, Justin. Our biggest problem all morning one was southbound 281 at Hildebrand. It was jammed up and even closed for a while, but those lanes are now wide open as of just after 9 a.m. And top stories we are following today. We now know the name of the woman killed while crossing a north side street last night. San Antonio police have identified her as 49 year old Thanalakshmi Subramaniam. It happened just before 7.30 last night in the 6400 block of Blanco Road. Officers tell us the woman was not using a crosswalk when she was hit by a driver. She was taken to a hospital where she later died. Investigators say the driver who hit her stopped to call for help and will not face any charges. Police say they plan to view surveillance video from a southwest side motel in order to learn more about a stabbing that happened right there in the parking lot. They tell us a man suffered several stab wounds to his upper body. This happened around 10 last night at a Motel 6 in the 7900 block of I-35 South. But officers tell us the victim drove himself to his west side home about eight miles away to call 911. When police found him, he was in critical condition, but they tell us he is expected to recover. Investigators are now trying to find the uh, assailant, but say the victim could not give them a good description of what he looked like. And happening today, KSET is hosting a live stream to discuss parenting in a pandemic. Myra Arthur will be joined by a panel of fellow parents, a child psychiatrist, an epidemiologist, and the founder of San Antonio Charter Moms. We want you to be part of that conversation. You can submit questions or advice right now on KSAT.com. Live stream is happening at 2 p.m. You can watch it live on our website or on the KSAT TV streaming app. In your other morning headlines, a firefighter becomes a hero and it runs in the family. And uh, there was a kangaroo chase, not down under, but in the state of Illinois. A meteor shower and another monolith mystery. Our David Sears is here. Hey, good morning. Morning, you David. You get that a kangaroo chase. A kangaroo that, chase. Right. What? Yeah, yeah, you don't think Illinois when you think kangaroos. Not really, unless you're going to the zoo or something. Or Outback Steakhouse. Apparently perhaps. there's a trend going on with these <laughs> little statues and desert. Yes, stuff. those monoliths. We'll have that for you in just a second. But first, there's a shot of flames from a burning building in Boston. Now, that's a firefighter, Liam Perro, making an incredible rescue of that little girl, taking her down the ladder very carefully. She's six-month-old Amelia. Firefighters also rescued her sister and her mom, who is deaf. They had to get them out of their third-floor apartment. At the last minute, this woman steps out onto the balcony with her two kids and the crowd just, you know, gasped. It was very dramatic. No fuss, um, uh, no panic, no screaming. They were, you know, once we had them, they didn't try to, you know, flail or kick or anything like that. They just, um, you know, they held on to us tight. All right, so here's the amazing twist of this story. The firefighter, Liam Perro, saved the little girl is the son of a firefighter who back in 1985 saved the little girl in just about the same way, bringing her down the ladder, getting her out of a burning building that happened to be a women's shelter. Heroism runs in that family. The family that the young Perro saved is out of the hospital, but unfortunately lost everything, including a lot of mom's hearing equipment. All right, your eyes do not deceive you. Yes, that is a kangaroo running around a neighborhood in Peru, Illinois. The local 911 center phone ringing off the hook. And this is a police officer following the route, trying to figure out, uh, we're gonna catch this little guy and get him back to his owner. The wallaby ends up going into the Illinois River, starts swimming, but before long, he's struggling to keep his head above water before rest Rescue boats can get called in. A couple of fishermen spot the little guy and then went after him. He's about out of energy. I like it. It's a kangaroo. <laughs> and you can see one of the guys was able to grab the roo with his nets. They got eventually got him back into the boat and then to shore and then rushed him to a local vet. Now the vet said they couldn't even get a temperature to register. It was so cold. They dried him off, warmed him up. Dr. Allison's prayer said was the first for her office. They eventually got the animal back to his owner. 
who says he does have a permit to own a kangaroo. The police are checking into that. But what a fish story those guys have to tell. All right. <coughs> Did you hear that? Yeah, a little boom right there. That boom over the skies in New York. Social media lit up. Apparently a lot of people heard it. Turns out there was a little meteor shower from 12.05 until 12.20. About 85 reports to the American Meteor Society of a fireball. Folks from New York to Ohio to Michigan, several other states saw it and heard it. From the data and the video, it looks like a meteor went through the atmosphere. The Meteor Society agrees. Robert Lunsford from the American Meteor Society says the sonic boom would be an indication to folks in the area to check their backyards looking for a little debris. And finally this morning, another metal object mystery. There it is. Yeah, monolith happens to be on a hiking trail in Atascadero. It reminds you of the one we showed you the other day that was in Utah. This one had the same fate. It was there and then it was gone. Somebody's playing some tricks somewhere. Well, and supposedly That's another one popped up in yeah. rural Romania, which yeah. is about half the country, but I in it's Romania, just, it's, <laughs> too. it's become a trend. Now. It has. It's so we're going to start to see it. Who knows where next? Maybe yeah. Hondo or Castroville. Hey, Who knows? 2020. <laughs> It'll yeah. be like the windmills that we're seeing on yeah, KSA just, Connect. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can get some ideas for it. What, what is that thing, Justin? The hide your elf. What is that? Elf on the elf shelf. On the on shelf? The shelf? Yeah, a little elf on the shelf from fun for you. I saw a meme that showed this year's elf on a shelf, and it was Chucky from the Child's oh Play my movie. Goodness. The Aww. 2020 version. Oh boy, it's been a year. Oh, David, yes, thank has. you. 909 right now, 44 degrees. Still ahead on GMSA at 9. If you want to rock around the Christmas tree at Rockefeller Plaza in New York, you're going to have to make an appointment. A breakdown of the safety precautions put in place amid the pandemic. The mayor of Austin under fire for going against his own guidance regarding traveling during the pandemic. Alana Rocher from the Texas Tribune will explain what happened later in the newscast and talk more about that mayor recording a video urging people to stay home while he was down in Cabo San Lucas. And the day Selena fans have been waiting for is almost here. The series about the Queen of Tejano is available on Netflix tomorrow. Erica Hernandez talks to one of the writers who worked on the show, who happens to be from San Antonio. Let's check stocks right now. They're up about 100 points, 29,984. And welcome back. It's 913. Tomorrow is the day Selena fans have been waiting for as the series begins streaming on Netflix. Well, a lot of attention has been put on the cast and Selena's story. One San Antonio man was a part of the team of writers who put this whole thing together. Our Eric Hernandez spoke with him about his first writing job in Hollywood. It still feels unreal. Raymond Arturo Perez has grown up knowing so much about the queen of Tejano music, Selena. Growing up in San Antonio, it was surreal that his first big writing job in Hollywood would be about the legendary singer. Selena is just part of the culture uh, and you can be of any you know race or, or ethnicity, but it's just it's a Texas story and it's become an American story. And it being the first job is just really, really special. Bettis, who graduated from Communications Art High School in the University of Texas in Austin, moved to Los Angeles about seven years ago and has been trying to get his big break as a Latinx writer. Oftentimes you'll see diverse casts, and it's not necessarily meaning that the writers of that show are diverse. And that is what made the Selena series so special and different. And this is one of those rare occurrences where our whole writers team is Latinx. So you know, we, we all are fans of Selena coming in, but then we also have just a, a breadth of experiences culturally, our upbringings, our socioeconomic class. While Selena broke many records and milestones, the series about her life and family could be just what the Latinx community needs to make a breakthrough in Hollywood. Um, I think we're still kind of further along behind in terms of having writers and directors and producers that are also Latinx on projects with Latinx characters. Um, so I'm excited to see that change and hopefully uh, increase in representation there. Now, the first part of the Selena series begins streaming tomorrow on Netflix. No word yet on when the second part, because there will be a second season, when that will be released. Mark and Stephanie, I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting really excited about this special. We're, we're I gonna, know you're going to be tuning in. Yeah, we're going to check it out. <laughs> Erica Hernandez, yeah, sure. thank you. Fly from home. Thanks, Erica. Justin's back now, and we knew we couldn't put it off much, much longer because it typically starts around Thanksgiving mm -hmm. here in South Texas. But mountain cedar season 
is here. It's here. Yeah. It is. Uh, you know, the northwesterly winds, that tends to do it. And we got some gusty northwesterly winds yesterday, likely kicking up some mountains here. The good news here, it's very low today. It's at 20. That's about as low as it gets. But we do think we'll see a, a steady climb. We always do as we get later into December. This uh, season, mountain cedar season, typically peaks right around uh, mid-January, so the 15th or so, and then uh, tends to wind down around Valentine's Day. So that's what we have to look forward to or not look forward to. Also, the drought monitor is in. I want to show you last week's first. So this is last week's drought monitor. Remember, we had the exceptional drought there south of Uvalde. This is the change today, and it's a good change. We dropped from exceptional down to extreme. Why? Because we saw that rainfall this weekend. It was really helpful. But that extreme drought still stretches from Uvalde, Curvo, Fredericksburg, even now into northern Bear County. So we're still dealing with drought situations for sure, and we still do need some rain. There's a little closer look at the stretch here of that area that uh, is in the worst shape. And it does include Canyon Lake now, too. Also Medina Lake, which we can uh, talk about the levels there. It's at 43% full. Uh, one week change down about uh, two tenths of a foot. So not as bad as it has been. Uh, I think the rainfall helps out Medina Lake a little bit, too. But we're still, again, very much in need of the rainfall. And there's not a lot in the forecast, I must say. 44 degrees right now. North northwesterly winds at about 13 miles per hour. Those winds created some wind chills this morning in the 30s. We still have a little bit of a wind chill out there. 44 Canyon Lake, 41 Comfort, 37 right now. Bernie Stage, we're at 42 currently in Hondo, 45 Del Rio, and then some mid-40s Pleasanton Kennedy over to Victoria. Uh, dew points are very low now, back into the 20s. They jumped up yesterday, and now this northwesterly wind has dropped these dew points once again. So the air will be very dry today, and the winds are going to stay pretty gusty. I'd say through about 5 o'clock, then they fall off a little bit, and they'll pick back up some tomorrow. But Friday will not be as breezy as today will be. And as we look at the uh, big picture here, you can see all the cloud cover there across parts of Oklahoma, North Texas. Some of these clouds are trying to sink south. I think they probably stay north of us. So we'll keep things mostly clear. We'll also watch for some high clouds that will be drifting in from the west a little bit later today. You can still see the rain out ahead of this last storm system, which will continue to move away. And then you see some of the high clouds by, say, 6 o'clock this evening. Then we'll watch this area of low pressure, which cuts off, moves into Mexico, and then moves towards us. Normally, when you get a system like this, it would bring us some good rain chances, but we don't have any moisture to work with. So it really just results in some cloud cover for us on Saturday. I can't rule out a sprinkle or two. The air is going to be so dry at the surface that mostly anything that falls is going to evaporate before it makes it to us. So the forecast for today, up to 56 for a high. Northwesterly winds 10 to 15 miles per hour and gusty. Extended forecast, we go 62 tomorrow, 61 on Saturday. We'll call it mostly cloudy. And then 66 Sunday and sunny. 70 on Monday. We'll get another weak front, though, that'll cool us down some Tuesday into Wednesday. Guys. Very Thanks. nice overall. Thanks, Justin. About 920, 44 degrees. And still ahead on GMSA at 9. It's a holiday tradition dating back to the 1930s. The Rockefeller Christmas tree is switching on its lights last night. How people will have to appreciate the tree a little differently this year. This essay salutes holiday greeting is brought to you by Jason's Water Systems. Hi, my name is Emily Watkins, owner of Jason's Water Systems here in San Antonio, Texas. I just wanted to give a shout out to all of our first responders, our military families out there for keeping us safe for all that you do for our families. Merry Christmas and a happy New Year's. We are about 22 days away from Christmas and all around the country, Christmas trees are turning on their lights. And that includes the Rockefeller Christmas tree in New York, which held its annual tree lighting ceremony last night. But as ABC's Will Gans reports, if you want to rock around this Christmas tree, you'll have to make an appointment. Three, two, one. Light it up. The 88th annual tree lighting in Rockefeller Center kicking off the holiday season. But this year, not a creature was stirring in New York City, marking a break from tradition. No spectators huddling together to sing along with Tori Kelly under the tree. A very special Christmas for me. Special indeed, a majority of performers social distancing in a big way. Kelly Clarkson joining from Los Angeles. Underneath the tree, come on. Dolly from Nashville. 
And to make sure no Christmas crowds attempted to rock around the Christmas tree after the big reveal, lights stayed on for a mere 30 minutes on Wednesday. In a normal year, up to 750,000 visitors a day come to check out the tree. But as we all know, 2020 is anything but normal. This year, visitors will have to scan a QR code to join a virtual waiting list. When it's their time, they can enter in groups of up to four and see the tree for only five minutes. Snap a quick picture, take a quick video. But even though a visit to the tree might look a little different this year, one thing remains the same. For more than eight decades, the tree at Rockefeller Center has stood as a beacon of hope for New Yorkers and beyond. The first tree put up in 1931 during the Great Depression. Construction workers pooling whatever money they had to buy a balsam fir and decorate it with tin cans and handmade garland. Now, all these years later, the tree's a little bigger and brighter, but remains a symbol of hope all the same, especially in 2020. This year's tree is a 75 foot tall Norway spruce. It's 45 feet wide and weighs 11 tons. Now that's a lot of tree to take in in only five minutes, but it's more time in Rockefeller Center than visitors will spend in Times Square this New Year's Eve. The annual ball drop totally virtual this year. No guests at all. Will Gans, ABC News, New York. Thanks, Will. Well, here at home, join Bay San Antonio Lackland feeling the holiday spirit. A tree lighting ceremony took place last night followed by a Christmas parade, a celebration, a way to bring joy to service member station there who must spend the holiday away from loved ones. It gives the kids a little excitement and it gives um, me some peace of mind, I guess, away from thinking about what's going on out there when he's coming home and all of the other worries that are in the back of my mind. If you want to watch the full ceremony, we do have the video right now on ksat.com. Love the U.S. Air Force tree topper there out at Lackland. Yeah, very cool. And there's a lot more ahead on GMSA at 9. 926 started the NBA season less than three weeks away. And this week we've heard from a couple of key Spurs players, David and RJ, here to break that down later in sports. A Christmas Grinch caught on camera sneaking into people's front yards in Denver, Colorado. Why some neighbors say they've asked him for the mischief. All of West Texas dealing with increasing COVID-19 cases and they are running low on hospital beds. We'll talk with Alana Rocha from the Texas Tribune about these popular tourist destinations and how they're leading the state in COVID cases per thousand residents. And as we head to break, a quick check of the roads looking there at Loop 410 and Culebra Road. Things running smoothly right now. We'll be right back. Many counties in West Texas are dealing with increasing COVID-19 cases. Presidio and Brewster counties, along with nearby Culberson County, are leading the state right now in cases per 1,000 residents. This as the Austin mayor is being criticized for making a video urging people to stay home and be safe while he was on vacation in Mexico. Alana Rocha with the Texas Tribune joins us now with the latest on these COVID cases and plans taking shape at the state capitol when it comes to the coronavirus vaccine. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Presidio and Brewster County is home to popular tourist destinations and along with nearby Culberson County, leading the state in cases per 1,000 residents in the last two weeks. There are reports that these counties are low on hospital beds. Are tourists to blame for the numbers? You know, in part, uh, of course, these small communities like Marfa, uh, 1,700 population, uh, rely on tourism dollars to keep their economy going. Uh, but with those tourists comes, uh, you know, these these rising number of cases of COVID. Uh, the alternative is businesses closing unemployment. So um, they haven't turned them away and there's been no regulations locally or at the state level from keeping people from visiting. Uh, but you know, the situation is dire because not only do these local hospitals not have many beds themselves, uh, the regional hospitals they rely on to send critically ill patients uh, are also experiencing a rise in cases like of course, we've heard of El Paso in the news, Lubbock, uh, Midland. And so in Culberson County, for instance, they've had to send people as far as 400 miles away to San Antonio uh, to get care. So, I mean, these doctors are just calling 15 to 20 facilities before they find a bed. And Lana, news that Austin Mayor Steve Adler was vacationing in Mexico when he made a video urging people in the capital city to stay home last month is not sitting well with many, including other Texas mayors. Uh, what can you tell us about this? 
Yeah, Dallas Mayor Eric Johnson tweeted yesterday that, for the record, he uh, was with his family, who, you know, just his household uh, for Thanksgiving, just kind of putting that uh, on the record. In response to, to news of Mayor Adler's travels at the beginning of November, uh, you know, in response, the mayor has said he didn't break any state or local orders uh, in traveling, but of course, uh, his travels did follow uh, the his daughter's uh, wedding that he hosted uh, here in Austin and South Austin, 20 people, uh, much smaller affair than they had originally planned, planned rather because of the pandemic. Uh, but that kind of violated uh, stage three restrictions that said people shouldn't gather 10 or more. Um, so yeah, he realized in a statement saying that, you know, while he didn't break any orders, uh, he knows it looks bad, didn't set a good example. And, uh, you know, given the alerts we saw, the fact that Wikipedia is already uh, updated for its entry, um, uh, Austin coronavirus and South by Southwest cancellation, uh, you know, he, he knows the optics aren't great. Despite news that Texas could receive a sizable lot of coronavirus vaccine doses this month, state leaders planning for more months of pandemic. What sort of plans are taking shape in Austin for the upcoming legislative session? They're still fluid, but we did get a kind of a glimpse on what the uh, work group that the um, expected speaker uh, has put together as far as, you know, plexiglass and committee rooms, uh, mobile voting as far as, as a system that will allow lawmakers to vote when they're not on the floor if they don't feel comfortable being at their desks. You know, in the House, at least it's 150 people. So that's uh, quite a few close quarters. Um, also, you know, sanitation, air filters, uh, kind of standard things there, but, you know, it could be um, we heard that the uh, top three governor, lieutenant governor and incoming speaker could be uh, at a news conference getting the vaccine to uh, boost confidence uh, in the science there and, and encourage others to get the vaccine. So a lot of moving parts, but regardless of what they adapt at the Capitol, um, you know, I guess the Capitol as a whole, each lawmaker has jurisdiction over their offices. And so some might require masks, some might require appointments. It's going to be a little piecemeal uh, approach. And uh, they're still trying to figure it out, but just a few weeks to go. All right. Alana Rocha with the Texas Tribune. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. And taking a look outside with live cam this morning, a cold 44 degrees. I think yesterday about this time we were in the 50s already. Yeah, it's been sort of a, a change the last three mornings. We're really cold, quite a bit warmer yesterday and then cold again this morning. But we did not get down to freezing. Some spots did, but not here in San Antonio. We got down to 36 officially here in town. 32 Fredericksburg, though. Rock Springs, probably Kerrville, too. We didn't get a report out of Kerrville. Their station is down, but likely down to freezing there. Hondo, 32 the low this morning, the other spot at freezing 42 right now in comfort 40 Bandera 46 Holotus 44 Randolph 43 at Stinson. There is still a bit of a wind chill too. those dusty northwesterly winds make it feel like it's 38 outside 36 and Hondo 34 New Valley. So it's still very much jacket weather and you may actually want it through the afternoon. Temperatures will, will only make it into the mid 50s for highs. We'll see some increase in cloud cover later this evening. Those winds stay pretty gusty too until this evening when they die down. So guys, Trans guide right now live look at 35 and 410 a lot of traffic out there, but uh, looks like we have no major problems to report. And the Spurs are back in the building. Training camp is underway for the silver and black. We're getting to hear from some of the guys this week. David and RJ are here to talk San Antonio Spurs. Oh yeah. Good morning guys. Silver and black. That music's going to grow on me. Yeah. It's I mean, not it bad. Will. It's pretty good. Yeah, it like it. It's, it's, it's <laughs> got a rhythm and flow to it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very good. catchy. Here's excited. the best part about the whole thing. They're back. We got to hear from Spurs head coach Greg Popovich a couple of days ago. Yesterday, we heard from LaMarcus Aldridge for the first time mm -hmm. since the bubble since while. the season <laughs> ended back in March. We heard from LaMarcus Aldridge and Patty Mills. Of course, Patty Mills kind of kept us informed about what was going on, especially in Australia with the fires mm -hmm. and in uh, some other things that was going on in his life throughout the uh, throughout the summer and everything. So we've heard from Patty a lot. But but to hear from LaMarcus yesterday, that was pretty Yeah, cool. that was good stuff. And I think the sort of overarching thing that we've heard is that the bubble ball will live. The bubble boys, <laughs> the bubble. <laughs> as we call them, uh, back in Orlando. Uh, look, they're going to continue to try and play this up-tempo style, this sort of flowing style. But the biggest question since, uh, really, since they came back after Orlando was, well, how is LaMarcus going to fit in? Because we all know LaMarcus is kind of a set in his ways, but... He says that he's uh, that he's ready to make some changes here. So, um, so I think this will be interesting moving forward. 
feel like I can I can mesh and you know play any style that I need to to you know try to help the team win games and uh, be better. I've always been able to shoot it. I think last year, you know, when Pop came to me and said, you know, I I need you to shoot it more. That's why I think the second half of the season, you know, I shot something. So now I'm going into the season with that same mindset. So LaMarcus Aldridge is going to be firing up threes like they were going out of style. You can tell he's excited about it, too. He gets to stand up behind a uh, three-point line and just shoot. Just shoot from out there. Go ahead. And that way you don't have to go back down the court that far. You just play a little defense and come back down to the three-point line and start firing up threes. But you know, so on the first of those set of highlights there, mm -hmm. Derek White was in the highlights. Well, guess who's not going to be in the game to start the season? Derek White. Yeah. The, yeah, that was some of the big news that uh, also broke this week. Derek White is still kind of dealing with uh, that toe injury that he had surgery on after the uh, bubble season ended. But also Keldon Johnson's going to be out, yeah. Quindary Witherspoon. Um, it, it'll be interesting here to see how they mix in some of these, uh, the younger guys and the older guys as well. And Patty Mills touched on this yesterday. You know, training camp is, is really relatively short compared to what they're used to with only three preseason games. Of course, the season starts on the 22nd. And then you look at the season itself. Itself, there's only 72 games. There is that all-star break with no game, so they kind of reevaluate where they are, what they might have to do with the schedule. But uh, Patty kind of touched on this a little bit yesterday, talking about how they're fortunate in the sense that other than the two rookies that they just drafted, they really don't have any new faces that are be major contributors on the team. So everybody's kind of used to what they were doing, especially all those guys that played in the bubble last uh, last summer. So they're they're kind of a step ahead of where they might be if they'd brought in a bunch of new faces. It's the growth of of players as you get older and as the game grows. And I think the head honcho of that is Manu Ginobili and how he's been able to um, adapt as, as he got older and, and how the game has changed as well. So the way that we played in the bubble was was fun, exciting with the young boys up and down, um, you know, the defensive pressure as well. Obviously looking to carry on from that. He, he's talking about Manu mm -hmm. making changes yeah. over his career. Mm -hmm. Who, who's, the, who's the guy that's making the biggest change? Well, I it mean, ain't a look, player. Uh, Pop, for sure. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I mean, but Pop's Pop has away. actually adapted over time. Remember, they had the Twin Towers, and then yeah. they got into the, the whole beautiful game Spurs. So, I first of all, I love hearing Patty talk. I mean, that guy can be a professor, and he'd definitely keep me awake yeah. <laughs> for any sort of college courses. Um, look, Patty's one of those guys that is just going to have to kind of get used to this new style. And Patty even said that during the Orlando bubble, he was sort of the uh, – he took Tim Duncan's place Duncan's coaching as spot. sort of yeah. the assistant coach there so Patty knows knows what to do he's the culture guy and I just uh, yeah Patty Patty's just a great dude <laughs> yeah he, he didn't play in the bubble so <laughs> he really spent, did he no. spent a lot of time you know from the right there from the uh, from the coaching angle and said he picked up a lot of different things as as he looked at the game and he looked at his team he looked at the players from a different angle and that's kind of what helps you when you when you sit on the bench like that and and kind of go at it from a different angle you can uh, you can pick up some stuff so he'll have some tips and pointers to help these young guys as they continue to to uh, get the season started and that was that was the thing he was talking about is there's going to be the older guys himself and LaMarcus and Rudy Gay and even DeMar, DeMar to, a, to yeah. a certain degree are going to have to make some adjustments as these younger guys kind of step up and take over the game and start pushing that ball up the floor and start firing away. I like what some fans said yesterday that this team uh, with its youth um, and in, in a sense, uh, untested uh, outside the bubble uh, is very much a dark horse team that could, that could go far. We just don't know at this point. Yeah, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they look, I mean, right now there's not a lot of high expectations, but I think, uh, like Patty said yesterday, they've had a year now to sort of learn the system. The younger guys, looking at Derek White, DeJounte Murray, Lonnie Walker, we're going to hear from Lonnie later today. Um, you know, those are the guys that are going to have to sort of take the Spurs here to the next step. So, he pretty exciting. Give me to make a prediction for the season. I, I'm waiting. I'm going to wait until right that, before yeah. the season. No. We'll, we'll see how training can So you, Well, so Pop you said us. NBA Finals, right? Here yeah, that's what, yeah. He, he did say that in a sound way. He said, oh, there's not going to be a game seven. So, David, will you tell us your prediction tomorrow? Maybe. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I, okay. I, you know what? I think they. I think if you look, if you look at, at what they have and, 
and the way they developed in the bubble, mm -hmm. I think they've got a great shot at making the playoffs. How deep they can go is that's just a whole. And you know, COVID's going to play a big role in it. Sure. Whether or not they miss games, yeah. whether or not guys miss time from having to sit out, that's going to be uh, that's going to be a factor this year. But I think the Spurs can can be a playoff team. I really do, especially well, with that play-in game new yeah, that's way they do things this year. Right. It's so, be yeah. Weird. Well, in the coming days of weeks, we have more time to shoot the ball about the Spurs. Uh, there we go. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks, guys. guys. All right. 941 or 942 right now, 44 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. Well, the song goes, you're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. But that's really not the case for this neighborhood Grinch in Colorado. Now he's bringing holiday cheer to anyone who wants it. 945, welcome back to GMSA at 9. Children have been writing letters to Santa for over 100 years, and now the U.S. Postal Service is expanding a program allowing people to take some of the work off old St. Nick. Operation Santa allows children to send letters to Santa, but anyone can help make those wishes come true. The program has been around for years in certain cities, but this is the first time it's digitally available across the country. USPS will post those letters in its Operation Santa website where people can adopt letters and send children gifts. This year has been a struggle for so many people in more ways than one. And Christmas and the holidays are weighing so heavily on so many minds that this is a way for the United States Postal Service to help Santa reach as many children as families as possible. And if you want to send your letter to Santa, all you have to do is write it before December 15th, put it in an envelope and write in your full name and your address. All right, and there's the address right there on the bottom of your screen and also on Sarah's envelope. It's uh, to Santa Claus at 123 Elf Road, North Pole, and then 88888, all eights. Uh, 123 Elf Road, North Pole, 88888. Use a real first class stamp for this so it won't go anywhere. We have all this information on our website at ksat.com. Hey, check this out. The Grinch caught on camera sneaking into people's front yards in a neighborhood full of Christmas cheer up in Denver. But get this, some neighbors say they actually asked for this kind of mischief. So Allison and his son Ethan came up with the idea and bought the costume. On Monday, they posted a video on social media and were flooded with requests for an appearance. 2020 sucked for everybody, and this is a good way for him to bring some joy in a safe way. I thought it would be a really great way for us to support him and also do something fun for the kids this year. And money raised from the bookings will go into savings and something flashy for Ethan, like a car. Car. In the meantime, he's selling giggles and scares all around the neighborhood. Ethan says he hopes to do this for at least two more years. So he's not such a mean one. Right. After he's all. not taking stuff. Yeah. He's a good Grinch. If that's possible. <laughs> 947 and Justin joins us now with a look at the, this morning's time lapse, which is always cool, especially on a beautiful sunrise morning. Yeah, clear skies. Sun was beautiful this morning. It, it was a little chilly, though. We did not get down to freezing here in San Antonio. Some places did, but not not here in town. And uh, saw the uh, shadows there start to develop. It's been a little bit breezy, too. 44 at the airport right now. Dew point is at 27, and we've got a north northwesterly breeze at about 13 miles per hour. Around Bear County, we're talking mostly 40s here. 47 Holotus, 44 at the airport, 45 Boulevard. You will run into some cooler numbers as you get up into the hill country. It's 36 at Lost Maples. It was down below freezing there last hour. 37 Rock Springs, 45 Del Rio, and then some upper 40s Gonzales down to Kennedy. Here's a look at the wind chill, too. Enough wind out there to make it feel quite a bit colder. 38, your current feels like number here in town. Feels like 33 in Fredericksburg, and we will get wind chills over the next few hours with winds uh, gusting up to about 20, maybe 25 miles per hour out of the north and west. And that also brought in the mountain cedar, as we talked about earlier. It's at 20 today. It did show up in today's pollen count. Unfortunately, not what we want to see, but pretty much what you would expect this time of year. Gusts today up to 25 miles per hour, I'd say through about the midday, and then the wind will start to fall off a little bit. We'll see calmer winds tonight, and then they'll pick up again some tomorrow, but not as breezy as what we're looking at today. Visible satellite picture shows we have some clouds north of Fredericksburg. That's some of the wraparound moisture from that upper level low that's sitting off to our northeast. So some of these clouds may work their way into the hill country briefly this morning. I don't, I don't think we're going to see any here in San Antonio, so mainly a mostly sunny day. There are some clouds, though, off to the west we'll have to watch that, that may try to move in this evening. And then you still have your rain setting up on the Mississippi River here, Memphis down to New Orleans, seeing some rain and still a little bit of snow on the backside of this thing. Here's the forecast going forward. That moves away, but we've still got a little piece of energy out here in Mexico, 
and this is going to swing south, then eventually east towards uh, South Texas. You know, normally we get some rain out of something like this. This is a pretty good setup for us, but there's just no moisture to work with. No moisture at all. It's very, very dry at the surface. So this is really just going to translate to some cloud cover, I think, for us on Saturday. Maybe a sprinkle. Other than that, uh, this system moves through and then we get some clearing on the back side of it for Sunday. Forecast for today, up around 56 for a high. We'll call for some increasing cloud cover later this afternoon. Those winds stay breezy uh, through about, uh, I'd say, 4 or 5 o'clock. And then 62 on Friday, we start off at 35 tomorrow morning, 61 Saturday, mostly cloudy, outside chance of a sprinkle. And then 66 Sunday, sunny. Uh, 70 on Monday, we'll get another weak frontal boundary coming through Tuesday, and that may cool us down some Tuesday into Wednesday, guys. 950, 44 degrees. We'll be right back. People always ask us, how come you look so chipper in the morning? They must think we get here before the sun comes up. The truth is, we live here. Welcome to my house, baby, Hello, that's my toothbrush. Night, night, Rai Rai. Sweet dreams, live with Kelly and Ryan. We need to get a clapper. <laughs> yes, we do. Coming up tomorrow on GMSA at 9, the performing arts industry has taken a hit during the pandemic, but the Ballet Conservatory of South Texas has found a way to carry on through the holidays. Alicia Berrera tells us when and where you can watch an in-person live performance. That's tomorrow at 9. Some of you may have some errands to run somewhere to be here in the next few minutes, and here's how traffic is looking at I-10 at the Fine Silver Curve. At the Y near downtown, no problems to report. Traffic looks great. We have some problems in the early morning commute, but uh, hey, we've moved on. It's almost 10 o'clock. Justin. Yeah, the sun's up, uh, sun's out, and we've got temperatures warming up. 48 degrees right now. We'll be up around 56 this afternoon. Another chilly start tomorrow, 62 on Friday, and more cloud cover on Saturday. All right, so it's known uh, that you're not allowed to kayak the world-famous Riverwalk. It's the central business district. It's just all sorts of problems. Right. But they had a program late this year that was so popular, they wound up extending it, and now you can. That's right. You can do this along the Christmas season. So it's a rare kayaking excursion along the San Antonio Riverwalk. has been extended through the holidays. The city of San Antonio uh, announced that the popular kayak Kayaking program will be offered on weekends through January 31st. That's right. Tickets can now be purchased for self-guided tours from 8 to 11 on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. The service will not run on Christmas Day or New Year's Day. So just so you know, reservations are required and the cost is $50 for two hours if you choose to launch your own kayak, paddle, and life jacket. A reservation is still required, but that will only cost you $15. Yes, so for more on this, go to ksat.com. This program was so popular that it sold out within a matter of, of weeks when we were first yes. talking about it. I think they launch at Tobin mm -hmm. and then go further down through downtown and then and then back out. And these were during uh, the times when it was actually hot. Like we had some hot weekends during this time and people still booked it. So I can only imagine now with, you know, nicer with, weather and the lights and the Christmas lights. The Christmas yeah. lights on. So that's going to be cool, even though it is from eight to eleven. So the lights may be off, but still no. you kind of get the same kind of festive yeah. feel. It's you'll, got a different vibe. You'll see the lights. It'll be pretty. Check it out more on KSAT.com. Have a great day.